do something so amazing that they will know that you are God. Bless us is my prayer today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with you to go with me to the book of Psalms 22, verse 1 in the King James. Psalms 22, verse 1 in the King James. Often, as a teacher, I'm always challenged with how a thing was articulated, or I'm praying about God give me the utterance to say a thing. Wednesday night I began to deal with this subject, and it got out, but as I was studying to continue the, the series we started last week, it was just like, it was so clear. I looked at it, God was like, no. <laughs> and uh, he says, you're not finished yet. I want to give you utterance. I want you to trust me for utterance. He says, I'll send some people to the dome today that need to hear it a particular way. Now, it, uh, it's not up to me to try to figure that out. It, there has to be in all of our lives an opportunity where you step out on the water. God is still inspiring today. He still is doing some amazing things and preparing you to do some amazing things. But the one trick that Satan has been able to really put on everybody in here, including me, is the feeling that God doesn't care or sometimes a sense that he has abandoned you. And so, what do you do when you feel like God doesn't care or God's not there or why am I going through this and why is this happening and why did you let that happen? See, it goes from the things that are happening to I need to blame somebody. Why didn't you? We're well, amazing. We, we, we're quick to blame God, but not the devil. And of course, you know that all of that's a lie from the enemy, but it, it helps to know that the biggest secret you have, that big secret that says, I feel like God doesn't care about me, that big secret that feels like, I feel like God has abandoned me, that conviction that speaks to you that says, you know, this is not right, something's wrong, I, I feel like I'm in sin because I don't feel like God cares for me, and you won't dare say that to anybody, but God knows your heart, so you might as well go ahead and talk to him about it, amen? He already knows how you feel. But notice this in the book of Psalms 22 and verse 1. Here's a sense of that. And David's like, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Familiar words, because Jesus also said this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roarings. And here's a Jesus on a cross who was whipped with a nine, cat of nine tails, who was unrecognizable, who bared a cross up to, to Golgotha's hill, who was nailed to that cross. And he looks up and he says, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So I'm saying to you that there's nobody in here who has not at one time or another in this walk felt like, where are you? <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> yes. where, where are you? And yet look at this scripture here in Luke chapter 12, verse 6 through 7 in the NLT. Luke chapter 12, verse 6 through 7 in the NLT. 
He says, what is the price of five sparrows? Is it two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. So the truth is that that's a lie that God doesn't care about you. I was up yesterday morning and began to enter into my time of prayer. And it just, it just dawned on me that I am one out of about seven billion people on the planet. And the God of the universe has time to speak to me. Guys, could you put up those pictures? I, I wanted you to see where I was coming from. The God of the universe moves on the inside of you and me. Religiously, that sounds in one way, but God lives in you. The God that made that, that's a real picture by the Hubble or, or the new Webb uh, uh, telescope, which is infrared. That, that's a, that's a, God made that. And he lives in me? Look at another picture. God made that. Billions of miles away from us. He created that. And he wants to guide me. Look at this. I just want you to wrap your, wrap your, wrap your head around it. He made, looks like a piece of art. He made, that's a real picture. That's not an artist's rendition. That's a real picture picked up this telescope. The maker of the moons and the, and the stars and, and creation. And he, he lives in me. He's intri he cares for me. He, uh, he made that and then me. That, that picture exists so far from me, there's not even existence of my scent. Now I understand in Psalms 8, what is man? What is this man that you are mindful of him, that, that you visited him? What is, what is it about man, God? What is it about man that you made him a little lower than yourself? What is it about man that you, you use a, a flesh uniform to visit him? Oh, babusha kakalapa. Somebody lift your hands up how great thou art, just how great thou art. If you have a, one more photo, you can let's show that to us. Just, he, he, this, the, the galaxies, so far away, they look like dots. And the galaxy that we live in is just the size of one of the smallest dots up there. But he wants to live in me. He wants to lead me and guide me and speak to me. And we want to turn it into a religious game. So he cares. Whenever you hear it again, it's a lie. Because if he didn't care, if he didn't think you were more valuable than a whole flock of sparrows, God cares for me. Would you say that? God cares for me. But yet we got to deal with this little thought, because it's going to come up even after the day. 
but hopefully you'll know how to respond to it better. <laughs> Somebody said, God is good. And then we respond by saying, all the time. You ever done that before? God is good. So I say, all the time. And yet you feel like if God really cared, now watch this, here's the key to this deception. If God really cared, wouldn't things be better? So now you're basing God's care on your condition. If God really cared, wouldn't I feel better? Wouldn't I be better? Wouldn't I have more money? Wouldn't, I, wouldn't my relationships be better? Wouldn't everything just be all, 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 all peachy king? If God really cared. So what do you, what do, you do when you feel like God, God doesn't care? What do you do? What does a person do when they have a baby who has a birth defect? You, 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 well, God, if you really cared, watch this. Why did, why did, my, why did this baby have a birth defect? What do you do when some scam, somebody ripped you off of, you know, you're 70, 80 years old, and they ripped you off and stole all your money, and, and it's like, wait a minute, man, I go to church, I take communion, I do this, and if God really cared, why did he let this happen? If, if, if God really cared, God, if you really cared, why, why did you let my marriage end in divorce? I tell you, this is wicked. This is devilish. Just that, that thought. Why did you let this end in divorce? Why did you let this person get shot? Why did you let my mama die? Why did you? What is this thing about blaming God? See, we, we don't understand how someone that could create the vast universe is what, what I've just showed you. How is it that he can care for me? And part of that is I, I'm still having, I'm still dealing with how can he care for me, one of seven billion people on the planet. What do you do? See, whether you say it out loud or not, sometimes your feelings say, if God were a good God, why doesn't he come through for me now? There it is again. If he, if he was a good God, God is good all the time. Well, why doesn't he come through me now? And then sometimes we use that same, that same text to try to get people to come and follow the Lord. Well, if you'll follow the Lord, then all, everything will be good. Everything, and that's just not the truth. Many believers have gotten the message, and this is the message that we've gotten. And the message is that if God cared, if he really cared for you, life would be easy. That's the message. If God really cared for you, life would be easy. And hey, if you come on over here and follow Jesus, life will be easy. You're having a rough time now, but come follow Jesus. Get born again, and life will be easy. And we bought that. That's not the truth. If God really cared, then the problems would go away. If God really cared, then we would have exactly what we wanted and we'd have exactly what we needed. If God really cared, my house would be paid off. I'd be out. Are you serious? Do you listen to yourself? You're taking the guy that created all of that that I just showed you and you're reducing him down to such simple problems that surely you And so what happened is, in our religious thinking, we have come to believe that if God really cares, then he's going to come through for me. If God really cares, life is going to be easy. If God really cared, problems are going to go away, and I'm going to have what I want and what I need. You just got to know that's deception. And yet that deception is a widespread belief in the body of Christ. And to the point that when these things are not taking place, we go to God and say, what's wrong? Have I done something to make you mad at me? God ain't mad at you. He ain't gonna never be mad at you. 
What have I done to deserve this? No, you don't get what you really deserve, so cool it. Okay, your little problem is not what you deserve. Hell is what you deserve. So here's the reality that, that came to me this past Wednesday. He never promised those things ever. He never promised it to any follower of Jesus Christ. He never promised that he would take your problems away. He never promised that you're going to have everything you want and everything that you need it. He never promised those things. He never promised those things at all. He never promised, he never promised that in any situation that he was going to come through for you. He didn't promise that. But somehow that's what we took out of Scripture. We mixed the context and moved the text, and we've been conned. It's not the life of Jesus' followers. It's never been. Troubles, please listen to me, even the most severe troubles that you can imagine are not evidence that God cares. Or, excuse me, it's not evidence that God doesn't care. All of the troubles that you have and experience, that's not evidence that God doesn't care. You, we think that our troubles, that's evidence. If you're in trouble and can't get out, that's evidence that God doesn't care. If you have need and you're not getting it met, that's evidence that God doesn't care. Your troubles, no matter how bad they are, they will never be, they are not evidence of God not caring. You got to get that in your head. And it's, 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 it's a mind-boggling thing right now because that's the stuff that really draws us to church. Let me go to church, pay my dues, so God can come and move this stuff out of my life. <laughs> and we miss the whole deal. God never promised he was going to take away the challenges that you have in your life. Here's what he promised. He promised you three things, his presence, his peace, and eventual restoration. <laughs> See, you're trying to get him in the mood of the problem, and he said, believe that no matter what your problems are, my presence, I guarantee you, I promise you my presence in every problem you're in. I promise you my presence in every trouble you encounter. I promise my presence in every pain that you have. I promise my presence. And I promise you that no matter how horrific those things may, come, may become in your life, I promise you that you're going to have peace in the midst of situations where you didn't think there was no way you could have peace. You'll pause and say, how is it that I'm having peace in this? He says, because I promised you peace in the midst of the storm. I didn't make a promise that you weren't going to have no storm. I made a promise that if a storm should come, you're going to have peace. If a storm should come, you're going to have me. And if a storm should come, whatever was taken from you in that storm, I'm going to redeem and restore and recompense you. I needed that. I've been physically under attack for almost three years. And I'm like, where are you? What? I'm your man. I've traveled eight million miles for you, Lord. Where you at? He says, I'm here. Do something. I am. I'm doing it right now. I'm taking full advantage of something I didn't sin to give birth to some amazing things in you that you'll see at the end. I got this revelation of his presence, and one night I laid down in the bed recently, and I was in excruciating pain. 
to the point where I said, I don't, God, please, I, I don't know if I can take this. And immediately, the pain was calmed, and I moved into a deep sleep where I didn't even know I had fallen asleep, and it was in the morning time. That's what he promised. That even, that even through the valley of the shadows of death, I'm going to be with you. Goodness and mercy, even in the middle of a hard time, that's the testimony of a Christian. That even when I'm, because some of them say, well, if you're going through the same thing I'm going through, then why do I need to get saved? Because when you're going through what you're going through versus what I'm going through, I got help in the midst of a trouble. I got a fourth man in the middle of a fire. I got deliverance in the middle of a lion's den. So now all of a sudden, I wasn't putting all the attention on the trouble. I started focusing on the presence, the peace, and rejoicing for the recompense that was going to come from all of this. And you know what I noticed? That I wasn't spending, since I wasn't spending too much time on the trouble. I hardly recognized it was there because I was more focused in on the presence and the peace. Peace is security in the midst of the turmoil. Amen. Now you got God, got some say, well, Pastor, I, I don't agree with that. I don't care nothing about what you agree with now, right now. I've been going through this thing for three years. I don't care, I don't care nothing about what you. See, God will give you a very present word, a, a right now word when you're going through something right now. I know that God's care of me is not determined by my trouble. We used to think all the time, we used to think that if a person's in trouble, it's because of their sin. John chapter 9, I believe, verse 1. Who has sinned, this man or, or his parents? And, and Jesus said, neither, but that the glory of God can be seen through their life. I, I ain't nothing bad about you if you're going through trouble. I just look at you and say, oh, the glory of God is about to be seen in your life. God's getting ready to do something outstanding. He's getting ready to do something miraculous. He's getting ready to do something marvelous in your life, and he's preparing you. Ooh, Jesus. Now, let's, let's look at what the Scripture says. I'm not glorifying trouble. I'm not glorifying the, the weapons of the devil. I'm just saying he can't win because what he's sent to destroy us, God uses to perfect us. Some of you have got to Make your mind up today. That's it. I'm done with fear. I'm done with being sad. I'm done with being confused. I'm done with being hurt. I'm tired of being broken. I'm tired of being the victim that ends today. I got his presence. I got his peace. And I got recompense coming. Let me give you this word, and you can apply it as the Spirit of God shows you. And all the stuff you're going through, listen to me. Don't forget to live. Don't forget to live. The pain, the sickness, the divorce, the abuse in your, in your life. While you're going through all that, don't forget to live. Mm -hmm. Trouble won't last always. That's what the Baptist preacher told me. He said, trouble won't last always. <laughs> trouble 
has an expiration date. And some of you are about to see the expiration of your trouble come on your life. But if it's still there, don't forget to live. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, 35 through 40 in NLT. We're going to go through these real quick. Hebrews 11, 35 through 40 in the NLT. He says, now watch, uh, watch this. Women received their loved ones back again from, the, from, from death, but others were tortured refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. You would think, well, they refuse to turn from God, so that nothing bad's going to happen to them. No, they were tur tortured because they refused to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with their sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, <laughs> wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection or completion without us. Isaiah 41, 10 and 13 in NLT. This is, it's there, but man, I tell you, verse 10, don't be afraid for I am with you. Oh, yeah. Don't be afraid, I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and I'm going to help you. Now, I'm not going to get rid of that, but I'm going to strengthen you, and I'm going to help you. Verse 13, for I hold you by your right hand, I, the Lord your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. <clears throat> and that is the promise that God made. I am here to help you. So no matter what you are going through right now, say out loud with me, God is here to help me. My God, my goodness. Isaiah 43 and 2, NLT. Isaiah 43 and verse 2 says, when you go through deep waters, there is again, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. The promise is, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to be with you. And how I many of you know there are certain things that can't happen when God is with you? That trouble can only do so much. Those boys walk through the fire and then come out even with the smell of smoke. That's what happens when God is with you, praise God. You might be going through something, but you're going to come out with the smell of it. It won't be on you, praise God. Hallelujah. Psalms 32 and 8. Psalms 32 and 8. He says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the, uh, this is so good to me, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. So God is sitting there saying, so what's the best pathway for your life? It probably won't be the one that you would choose because your pathway would be trouble-free. He says, I'm going to guide you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to guide you along the best pathway for your life. It's not going to be a trouble-free pathway because there's preparation when you go down a pathway. You got to be ready when you come off of it. I will advise you and watch over you. This is the promise. I will advise you so there's wisdom that's there. I'll talk to you. I'll advise you. I'll watch over you. 2 Timothy 3 and 12 said, those that live godly must suffer. 2 Timothy 3, 12, those that live godly must suffer 
uh, persecution. He says, yes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What, what, how do we get that wrong belief when he says anybody that chooses to live godly must suffer persecution? Which means there, there's got to be some type of objective, some kind of reason why that is. Why must we suffer persecution? It's like, come on, God, you're God. Why, 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 why must? Listen, where's the cloud? Where's the Coke, the Coke that you drink? What, where's the? <laughs> you got to get clear out these days, there's so many terms. <laughs> where, where? We, we want to have, we, we want to have a chilled life. Think with me just for a moment, please. Then we move on. Let's take all your problems away. Let's take all your troubles away. Let's say, let's say you got everything you need and everything you want, all right? Put yourself in that position. What, what, your, what is your life like? How can you even be an overcomer? You got to have something to overcome. Amen. You'll probably end up hunting for sin. Because ain't nothing going on, ain't nothing challenging me. I mean, you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're going to be average. You're going to be stuck in average. That's not how this works. That's not how this life works. It, I, 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 don't, I don't know, because I just hadn't been there yet. I don't know. But it's like he's preparing us for something. It's almost like, it's almost like, why are you training us in the flesh for when we leave the flesh? It's like these spirit beings need to be under some type of training for something. I don't know. It's just, I know it's not for no reason at all. I know he's training us for while we're in the body, but why must it be a part of the life curriculum? Even if you get saved. Somebody said, I was having enough trouble before I got saved. You mean to tell them I got more? You remember when, they, when, they, when Jesus was talking about Paul? He says, I've got to show Paul how much he got to suffer for my name's sake. And he still took the call? <laughs> if God said, I'm calling you, if he showed up in a burning bush in your room and says, I'm calling you, but you got to go through a lot of persecution, you mean you going to sign up for that? Yeah, I would, because of the one who called me. I want him. And as soon as we get the reality of this, we can quit playing church. We can quit being self-righteous and looking at people and say, you know, I am better than you are. You can quit doing all that. And you know what happens when you, when you get to that point? Well, you can start, you can really start encouraging one another because even though you come in sometimes acting phony as you want to be, like ain't nothing never, ever, ever happened to you. <laughs> Lie like a rug all the time. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed of the Lord. There ain't nothing wrong with me. It's flawless, perfect, perfect. Well, it, you, you know what you're saying to me? God has no need of you. Because you ain't in preparation for nothing. You just one of them laying on the clouds, drinking a, a bottle of Coca Cola, a big, big, and you ain't, you, ain't, and you ain't going through nothing. You ain't going through nothing. You ain't been through nothing. You ain't interested in going through nothing. And I will quit church, quit God, stop being a Christian if the trouble lasts too long. And that's why folks leave church. Well, I don't want to go to that church because I don't like that. I don't like this. And, and here's the funny thing. You find a church that may be doing, they may do a better job at hiding it than I do. <laughs> well, I don't like how he said that. Boy, you ought to be in the back after church. They're using MF and, and all them other stuff. They're saying all kinds of stuff. You don't know it. I done been back there like, ooh, you just finished preaching and you got all that in you? Glory to God. <laughs> See, when I cuss, I cuss on the pulpit. Because <laughs> I know I need God's help. I know I need the Lord to help me. I, need, I know I need the Lord to mature me. And as a result, I don't cuss on the pulpit no more. Not, not that much more, no more.
we're, we're, we're in this fable. We, we, we created this fable, this church thing fable, this church thing fable. Can you not see it? Aren't you fed up with this little? Yeah, this is the way we go to church, go to church, go to church. This is the way we go to church. You can tell who don't know God for real. You can tell who don't have no relationship with the Holy Ghost. You can tell because that ain't the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost counsels you in your problem. You, you ought to, well, I, I'm married now, and my mate now, we ain't had no arguments since. You either a liar <laughs> or y'all don't ever see each other. <laughs> Because y'all were given to each other to help mature each other. And if you want to marry somebody you can control, you're denying an opportunity for you to become better and to be mature. Get, get one of the women that look at you and you say, cook something, and she's looking at you like, now nah, I'm tired. <laughs> no, nah, she got to be rebellious because she don't want to be controlled by you. See, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I ain't asking you what you agree with. I'm talking about your immaturity and God loving you enough to try to mature you so you can be ready to be used by the kingdom. But he can't use no little old bitty baby who all he praying for is, Lord, take this away, take that away, don't let that happen, leave that alone. That's why you're scared to pray, Lord, let your will be done. That's why you're afraid to pray, Lord, let your will be done, because you want to know what, what, what that means. <laughs> and that is probably one of two of the most major things we need to be doing in our lives. Number one, yielding to the Holy Spirit. And number two, Lord, let your will be done. And I'm telling you, you, you think about it. Every time I pray, let your will be done, and, and I'm already in something, I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> but I want his will. I want his will. I had no idea I would lose these many friends by preaching the gospel of grace. I figured, here it is in the Bible, 15,000 times. Wow. But I want his will more than I want some guy's friendship. Are y'all listening to me? World changers, are you hearing me this morning? John 16, 33 says, in this world you shall have tribulation, and then has enough, enough nerve to say this, but be of good cheer. <laughs> in this world you will have tribulation, hey, but be happy about it, be of good cheer. Why? Why? Because I've overcome the world, and I'm with you. We're coming, and I'm with you. I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to guide you. Follow me. I'll show you how to get through this. Jesus was beat up with, with a cat of nine tails, nailed to the cross, and if that wasn't us, went to hell. A lot of us ain't been to hell. And my, you might have thought you were in hell, but you ain't gone to the real hell. And Jesus said, no problem. I've been there. I'm with you. Be of good cheer. The trouble's going to come, but I done been through all of it. Follow me, and I'll walk you out of every fiery situation in your life. You might as well follow me because trouble is going to be there. Tribulation is going to be there. Persecution is going to be there. I am your way out. Ooh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So we are promised that he will make everything right in the end. He'll make it right. First Peter 5 and 10 in the NLT, he's going to make it right. Now, here's the thing I rejoice over. I look at everything I, 
I go through in life. You look at everything you go through in life. There's a payday coming. Yeah. And every now and then he allows you to receive a, a early harvest. It all ain't going to come at the end. You're going to be getting some bonuses <laughs> while you're here. Ayata kushata. Some of your body's under attack. You're going to have perfect health and live to 100 and whatever. Yeah. If some of you just been attacked financially, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, all right, let me get a little bonus. You did good on that one. I am. What's this law? Recompense. And then the Holy Ghost say, enjoy it while you can. The next one getting ready to come. <laughs> so in the meanwhile, let's look at some steps I gave on Wednesday of what to do in the middle of that emotional, I really believe it's an attack of feeling like you've been abandoned, feeling like you've been abandoned because of unanswered prayer, feeling like you've been abandoned because, you know, you, you feel insignificant. All the reasons that you have to feel like God has abandoned you, and I am telling you, he has not. But what he's not going to do is interfere with your growth when he called for it. He's not going to do that. He'll help you through it, but he's not going to take away the thing that's going to help you prepare for the whole reason why you're born. So if you feel God doesn't care, number one, here's what you do. Have a flashback of what God has already done for you. Did y'all hear what that? Have a flashback of what God has already done for you. Psalm 77, verses 10 through 12 in the NLT. Think about what he's already done. And if he was able to get you out of that and handle that, and that turned out all right, and that turned out all right, and that. And so maybe it wasn't this gigantic big miracle, but it's, it's, it's just God just moving secretly and quietly in your life. And you just look up and say, oh, wow, that's taken care of. Oh, 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 that's, oh, oh, that's good. Oh, oh, that didn't turn. So it wasn't something real big. It's just, you know, every day. And then you look at it and say, oh, wow, that's, it's going to be all right. See, that's what God can assure you, that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Okay, it, it feels pretty rough right now. It looks pretty rough, rough, rough right now, but you're going to be just fine. You're, you're, you're blessed. You're going to be fine. Just take a deep breath in it. All right, God, let's go with it. Look what he says in, in uh, verse 10. He says, and he said, this is my fate. The psalmist starts, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. That's what he thought. And that's what some of us have thought sometimes. God has turned his hand against me. And look at verse 11, and then you start talking about, well, it must have been when I didn't do that, or I should have did that, or I should have prayed that five more minutes, or, oh, you know, oh, Lord, I, I missed 50 cents on the 10th, and, oh, God, what? He said, but then I recall all you have done. He had a flashback. The devil was trying to get him with it. He said, no, no, let me look at what God has already done. But then I recall all you have done, oh, Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts, and I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. You need to get the mighty works of God that you have seen in your life, and you need to get them in your thinking. And when you don't think God doesn't care, you have a flashback and start talking about, look at what he did five years ago. Look at what he did last year. Look what he did this month. Look what he did yesterday even had time to tell you what he did yesterday. Amen? Have a flashback. Number two, be strengthened by the faith of other people. Be strengthened by the faith of other people. There's something that happens when you hear that somebody is going or has gone through what you may be going through yourself. I don't know, it does something for me. It gives me, it gives me hope. It gives me strength that, wow, they went through it too. Oh, wow, they, I'm, I'm going through something similar. They made it too. That's why you should not dismiss your experiences of hope and faith that you've gone through with God, because those experiences can be used as a tool 
to encourage and strengthen your brethren. That's one of the reasons why God let it happen. So you can carry that tool for somebody just like you one day who will come down your path, and you can use your testimony to strengthen them. It's not all the scriptures you know. It's just what you've been going through, the patience that you were able to have. Or, 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 or a mother who's raising her kids, and her kids are little hellions, and she thinks, oh, my God, they're going to be like this forever. And then somebody came, she said, you know, I have some hellions just like yours. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're going to be just fine, honey. You keep just loving them, and you keep just trusting God, and you give them to the Lord, and every now and then get a little Crisco and dab it across their forehead. <laughs> But it strengthens you. It just gives you hope, like, wow. And then when it happens, you're like, wow, just like what they said. Praise God. So don't you think you have testimony for no reason at all? Prepare to use those testimonies to be a blessing to people. Don't nobody want to hear no sermon. They ain't come there to learn nothing. Tell them a testimony about what you've been. You're always trying to teach something. Shut up. Do, do, do your testimony. Do your testimony. Don't nobody want to hear about no more Greek and Hebrew and no revelation God showed you for you. Get you, you, you your testimony. Number three, know that you are in good company. Know that you are in good company when, when you feel like God doesn't care. I mean, some of God's best friends question him. Uh, let me sh go through this real quick. Uh, in Exodus 5, 22 and 23, Moses, would you see? I mean, you, you think Moses and God are tight, and he would never question him about being abandoned. But look what Moses said here in verse 22 and 23. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue him. How's Moses saying that? Lord, you're abandoning your own people. And look at David, Psalms 42, 9 through 11. Psalms 42, 9 through 11. <laughs> See, not only are you in good company with probably everybody here, but you're in good company even with the people in the Bible here. Verse 9, he says, oh God, my rock. But he calls him his rock. But look what he says, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Okay. Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff. Where is this God of yours? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. But you saw them having questions about whether or not he cared for them. And then finally, Martha, in John chapter 11, verse 21, uh, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. That's a huge statement. You know what he was saying? You know what she was saying? You know, you know my brother died because you were not here. Now, I don't know why you weren't here. I mean, you have a problem being on time. I don't understand what the issue is. <laughs> I mean, man, come on, you're, you're, you're Jesus, and you're late, and my brother died because you couldn't get here on time. Now he did. Well, I can raise him up. He stinketh right now, Lord. He been dead four days. You're in good company. But the difference between these guys and you, you weren't trying to act like that's not, not in you. You want to try to act like you're not dealing with it. And the thing you don't understand, God already knows your heart. You see the many scriptures in the New Testament when Jesus said, and he knew their thoughts. So you should just go ahead and be honest with him. I do. I go to God sometime and I'm like, I don't get it. You tell me to teach something, did you know this was going to happen? <laughs> These people think I'm crazy. And where are you? No sign, no wonder, no lightning, no nothing, no earthquake. So I said, what did he say? What did he say? I ain't hear nothing. I 
tried to hide from God that, that, that it hurt me. And, and here's what he said. He said, are you hurt? And I wanted to say no, but he already, no. So what I'm going to do, lie to the spirit of truth? But that's what some Christians do. And you call it faith. I would rather people, if, if, in order for me to just not have to guess what's wrong with them. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, and all is well. Well, I don't know nothing. I don't, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, the doctor gave you three days to live, and you just told me that. <laughs> what I'd rather you say is, you know, <laughs> I've been given three days to live, but I believe God. You know, I had a man to tell me that. It was on Christmas Day. Uh, some friends that, that came over to my brother-in-law's house, and, and uh, they said, could you pray with us? The doctor's given him a month to live. And I said, oh. I said, I, what do you think? He says, well, I, I believe God. I said, well, I do too. And we prayed. You know, he's still living. Yeah. He's still living. I know he's glad he didn't say, hey, how you doing today? All is well, for this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice. Eto, come on outside and time my time. Honda, Honda. Stop. We closed the circus, and we put the clowns out. I am not playing church no more. Now, there are plenty of people who have the circus still open in their church. I'm done. I'm done. I don't need, I don't need a new, no, I don't want none of that. I don't need somebody in the congregation. Preach, pastor. Come on now. Yes, sir. Woo, yo. You shut up because you're disturbing the people around you, and unlike you, they're trying to hear so they can live a better life. You ain't taking note first and up there making the most noise. Ah, yes, sir. You better say it now. Say it now. You showed up right. That's what he told me. Said the same thing to me. The whole time I'm preaching, you got somebody around you? You have my permission to write them a note. Please hush. <laughs> having church. Ain't nothing about that except disturbance. You have your time to do all that through praise and worship. You can holler, scream, dance, do cartwheels, shout and talk during every song. But don't nobody want to hear your religious jargon while I'm trying to communicate a message? And then I can't say this. See, I wouldn't say it before, but I'm free. I couldn't say it before because... I said it before, people. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think people ought to be able to praise and worship the Lord. That ain't what praise and worship is. You can't be shouting and hollering and screaming and disturbing everybody, and then when you get out there, God says, I want to use you to do this, and you say, I don't want that, God. Then you miss your time of worship. You don't worship when you come here. You come here to be edified. You worship when you walk out these doors. Let me tell you, I tell you that. Worship is not just coming in here and singing a slow song, falling on your face like you really have an intimate relationship with God, and then going out and allowing him no opportunity to use you and do anything through you. Yeah. I'm tired of all these church games. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm just so tired. It don't make no sense to me. I'm tired of it. Well, I ain't agree with that because you don't know no better. Because you've been where you were and you done took what you took and you done resolved what you resolve. Like the Spirit of God is not inspiring nobody no more. You're treating it like the Spirit of God only inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Paul. And he is still inspiring today. He is still inspiring. He's inspiring you. He's, inspi he's inspiring you with something deeper than what Matthew wrote. He's inspiring you with something deeper than what Paul understood. But you're too scared to let him guide you and lead you in the deepness of revelation for your life. Now, everything he shows you wasn't meant to be preached, but he'll show you a lot because it's meant to be lived. And you need revelation to overcome some of the stuff you have. And he's still inspiring people. 
Because every time I get up here and try to inspire you with what God inspired me with, you'll say, well, that ain't God because the Bible said. I'm telling you what the Holy Ghost said, and you're telling me what the Bible said. Well, I don't understand that. I, it's just got to be. What, this, that all this Bible is, is the inspiration that God gave them. So has he stopped inspiring people? But your elementary little self, you just, ah, well, I know it's Jesus wept. But have you ever found out why he wept? One day I asked him that. I said, Jesus wept. Is there anything you want to show me? He said, yeah. Had he not wept, he said, that dude wouldn't have been raised from the dead. I'm like, oh, that is in the same context. I said, what did he actually do? He said he was praying and groaning in the spirit. And then I found several times where people did it. Have you ever been praying in the Holy Ghost so much that you couldn't even talk no more and all you could do was just kind of cry and groan and utter? Jesus did that. And he said, Lord, I have prayed. I, I, he said, I pray more than all of them. He said, I've already done this. And he said, come forth. And I thought Jesus' wept was just a, I thought it was just an Easter speech for dumb kids who couldn't remember nothing. <laughs> Jesus wept. <laughs> That's what I thought. I'm, I'm not playing. That's what I thought. I'm just telling you what I thought. <laughs> Don't sit up there judging me. He's still inspiring. He, he'll inspire you with something for somebody who's in deep trouble. Amen. Have you ever been put in a situation and you ran into somebody's trouble and you couldn't recall a scripture that dealt with that? But if you let the Holy Spirit just start working through, you'll start saying stuff. And after you finish saying, you can think of several things that may go along with that. But let him continue to inspire you with revelation. And write the epistle of caring and the epistle of kin and the epistle of Joseph. There's still epistles that need to be written. Yeah. Write it. I am. My office is full of epistles that I have written. I wrote an epistle on cynicism and how it was the biggest enemy to grace that exists. That the cynic always has a problem with everything that comes by grace. I promise God that in this season of my life, I ain't holding nothing back thinking about what somebody gonna say about what I had to say. Ain't nobody asked them to listen. But this world needs bold leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you one more. Get some rest. No, that's the fourth one. Somebody said, I said, get some rest. Somebody said, yeah, amen. <laughs> Now, maybe, maybe, you know, you're feeling the way you're feeling because, you know, I don't feel like God cares for me. Maybe you're just exhausted. And things are a lot darker when you're exhausted. Maybe you just need to get some rest. As someone who has traveled way over 8 million miles around this globe, there have been times I was so tired. I was like some of the disciples, Elijah. I just like, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm tired. I, it's a kind of tired that's not a physical body tired. It's not even a mind tired. It's a, it's a, it's a deep soul tired. You can pour out and 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 you get empty. And if you don't address that, if you don't see rest as spiritual, things around can seem darker. And you'll pray dumb things like, God, take me, I'm ready to go. God, I'm tired, I just want to die. When you just probably need to 
get some rest. And part of that getting rest is just stepping away from the norm. December is my time where I step away from a lot of stuff. I don't do no administrative stuff. I don't do no counseling. Somebody says it's an emergency. I don't let somebody's emergency become my emergency. That's why you got to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And I take a deep breath and I realize rest is spiritual because it almost killed me one time. I had a spirit of suicide on me so heavy. I was so tired. That was the year I tried to take almost 80 invitations. That's insane. I just tried to be everywhere. There were times I had meetings in the morning and one at night in two different cities. I was exhausted. Everything was dark. God, you don't care. You've abandoned me. And finally, he just said, you're exhausted. And my wife had the good God sense to just get me out of town. And she got me out of town. And I stayed in that room the first three days just praying. And the Lord said, the problem is, is you're preaching out of an empty spirit. Wow. He said, rest is spiritual. And some people don't think it is. It's spiritual. Cut some things off. And so it was. Things started looking a lot better afterwards. It's like, wow. Hey, God, how you doing? I thought you abandoned me. No, I've been here the whole time. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't see you. I was just tired. A football coach will take his best players and put them on the field when there's a rough game. I never forget when we had a championship game that came up and I had fractured my ankle and got it taped up. Didn't think I would play. And the last minute, he said, I need you to go in the game. And I'm thinking, but my ankle, he says, yeah, your 75% is better than that guy's 100%. And that's the same thing with some of you. You wouldn't be alive today in this world if God didn't think you had what it take to get through it. Moses and them probably would have choked up during this season. But you're just what this season needs. God's got you in the game, and you may get hurt, and you may get injured, and that ankle may get, maybe, maybe injured worse than what it already is. But it's a wonderful thing that God says, I'm going to go ahead and test you because I'll be with you. I will be with you. Somebody shout, how great thou art. God cares because he sees you. He intimately knows you and will never forget about you. God is for you. God is always near you. He will never leave you nor abandon you. He will redeem and restore the shame of your youth. God will take care of you and care you and your life even when when you're old and even when you're gray. God intimately and personally created you with his own hand. He values you. He delights in you. You're precious in his sight, and he loves you. You are his own child, and you are a part of his family. He chose you. His own spirit dwells in you. You're his masterpiece. He created you. He cares more about having a personal relationship with you than he does about what you can do for him. He has prepared a purpose for you. He has a really good plan in store for you. He's always working on your behalf, both to give you the will and the power to do what pleases him. 
He began a good work in you, and he'll see to it. He will see to it that it's completed. He'll never turn away from you. He won't reject you. He hears you. You don't have to carry the world on your shoulders. God cares about your heart and wants to, to bear your burdens. He cares about your desires of your heart. God wants you to come to him and ask him for what you need and want. God wants you to come to him and ask him for wisdom. And on and on and on. He cares for you. He cares for you. He always has, and he always will. Settle that today. God cares for me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you and we give you praise for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask that the Holy Spirit will begin to minister to the hearts of those who are here today. No matter how long I live, I'll need help. I need help to articulate. I need help to give, to get, for you to give me the utterance. But Father, there's one thing that I don't have to help you with, and that is you cause the increase. We water, we plant, but you cause the increase. And I pray and thank you that you will cause increase today. I've sown the seed, I've watered the ground, you cause the increase. Let something so magnificent happen as a result of what they have heard this day. They'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's worship God with our offerings. It is the final act of this worship service. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. The ushers will give it to you. You know, when we give, the Bible says to give out of a cheerful heart, not out of necessity. We're not giving because if we don't, we're going to go to hell, and if, and, then, and if we don't, then we won't become a millionaire. No, no. We're not giving out of necessity. We're giving out of the pure enjoyment of being gracious and thankful and showing gratitude to the only one that could save us. And we give worship. We give glory to his name by bringing an offering and worshiping him in the beauty of his holiness. For he is God, and there is none like him. And the wonderful thing to give is a part of this worship. Those of you who are online in our e-church, you have an opportunity to participate with us too. <clears throat> Don't dare let staying at home stop you from being a part of this worship. If you're given through the text, the information is on the screen, call. Information is on the screen, even a code there is on the screen. Amen. God's got you. This is like a thanksgiving to God. It's like, whew, it's like thank you so much for everything you've done. And I, for me, this is how I've, I got to worship you. I got to worship you. Thank you. Use me. Do with me in this offering right now, in this offering. It's so amazing. It's not what you can do for God in worship. It's what you will allow him to do through you. And he is doing something through you right now, even in your gift giving. That's amazing. He's doing it. And that's why this is a time of worship, because it's a time where we're going to him and say, like, Lord, what do you want to do through me? What do you want to do through me financially? That's why this is considered as worship. Not just bucket plunking or doing something that fulfills or stops a curse in our life. Lord, what do you want to do through me financially? And allowing him to do that through you, that's worship. 
and that does a great deal in the kingdom. Give unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Amen. If you're ready, let's go ahead and pray over this. You're given by your devices, envelopes, or whatever. Father, we thank you that as we sow this seed, as we plant, we are doing it to worship you. We thank you that through us today, we can plant and we can give. And we give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just go ahead and receive this. And those of you who are giving, you can give according to what's on the screen. <clears throat> and we are just thankful and grateful to God for using you today and doing through you today. Through you, this offering comes. Through you, this gift is given. And it's done, that's why I say it, from a cheerful heart. From a cheerful heart. Amen, amen. We got a lot of cool things that are going on in December, and I guess you got the word that New Year's Eve is not going to be at, like, midnight. I was so tired last year, I couldn't even see straight when, when, when it came time to count down. I don't even know if we did a countdown. I was, I was discombobulated, and I just needed to get home and get in my bed. I ain't, I'm like, what is this? And I was trying to look in the Bible. Where, did, where in the Bible did it say you had to have at 12 o'clock? I couldn't find none. So we're going to be meeting at 7 o'clock this year. Get you out. And, I, and, I, and again, I feel a lot of safety, uh, too. You know, I, I don't want you, you out when folks still don't understand. When you shoot a bullet up, it come down. Dog, oh, what's wrong with them? You can't go up there. This ain't like, you know, Matt Dillon and Gunsmoke. <laughs> so, there's several good reasons why we're, we're making that change. Okay, <clears throat> real quick, those of you who are here and you, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you're not born again, and those of you who are viewing on the screen, pray this prayer with me. You want to get saved, you want to get born again, you want Jesus into your life, pray this with me. Father, I come before you now, <clears throat> acknowledging that I am a sinner, but today I repent of my sins. I receive the free gift of your forgiveness. I need a Savior. Jesus, be my Savior. Come into my heart and save me. So now by faith I declare that I am saved because of my belief in you, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, you can text the keyword, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. You provide your <clears throat> name and email address, and we'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. Amen. Now, those of you who are uh, led to join this church today, you feel like, hey, I think I found the church I want to be at. Uh, well, we want you to respond right now. Uh, so if you're here and you believe that God wants you to join this church today, or if you just prayed that prayer of salvation, would you please come to the altar right now? Just get your Bibles and personal belongings. Just meet me right down here. We'll pray with you when, uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when you come. Those of you who are online and you'd like to become a part of our e-church, you can go to worldchanges.org and click join at the top of the page. Or you can text join WCCI, that's all one word, to 51555, and we will send you all the benefits of e-membership. Welcome to World Changers E-Church. <clears throat> Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Anybody else? Falcons got a game today. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Father, we thank you for those who've come down, and I pray in Jesus' name that you will maximize their life as a result of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, come on. At this time, you can turn this way and follow this gentleman to the prayer room. They're going to take you and minister to you, answer some questions, get some info from you. 
and we believe the best is yet to come in your life. Congregation, you can stand for the final blessing. Thank you all so much for taking your time to come out uh, and to be with us in the World Dome today. We certainly appreciate it. We love you, and we believe the best is yet to come in your life. And now unto him, the Spirit of grace, who will lead you and guide you and comfort you. Now unto him, the Spirit of grace, who will perfect and mature you, who will protect you. I plead the blood of Jesus over your life this week. No hurt, no harm, no danger. And I pray that you will remain in perfect health and that if anything has touched your body, I declare that with his stripes you are healed. I pray over your children. I pray over your relationships. I pray over your prosperity that nothing in this country will hinder or stop the needs that you have in your life from being met. So now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you to the Almighty God, whole, sound, and in peace. I declare peace, peace, peace over your life all week long. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful day today. <clears throat> what if? We could take every groundbreaking message on grace, all the life-changing sessions from conferences, and every radical interview with the stars and those with inspirational stories that moved us, and share them with you 24 hours a day. Now we can. This is our network. It can all be found here. Changing Your World Network. Streaming hope, grace, and the wisdom of God with simplicity and understanding. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for free. Download the Creflo Dollar Ministries app on your smart TV and streaming devices. Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, and Begin Streaming, changing your world 24-hour network through the app today. Visit cywn.tv for more information now.